Well, hey there, everybody. Greetings and uh, welcome to yet another ball publishing webinar. I am Chris Bates, editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazine and e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we tackle today's topic. Well, you see it right there on your screen. What makes a growing container automation friendly? Now, I've been doing webinars. I actually checked this morning. I went back in my files. I've been doing this for about a decade, believe it or not, and this is probably the first time I've done a webinar on the lowly flower pot. But uh, we shouldn't, we should not disparage our modern plastic containers or take them for granted because without them, think about it, you'd still be schlepping heavy terracotta or wrapping seedlings in newspaper to get them to your customers. And you can imagine what a mess your customer's cars would, car would be. So, uh, so for this webinar, we're going to take a look at two specific aspects of plastic containers, um, how they can either help or hinder your mechanization uh, and efficiency efforts, and how they can actually improve your efficiency even if your greenhouse or nursery isn't mechanized. Now, as I always tell you, I am not the expert on the topic, uh, but I am an expert at finding experts. And for this webinar, we've got two. Uh, our first is uh, Mr. Chris Soltis, Director of Sales for the Eastern Region for the HC Companies. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having us here today. My pleasure. Now, where are you broadcasting from today, Chris? We are in lovely Middlefield, Ohio, in northeast Ohio. Out in the middle of a field somewhere. We are. Beautiful. <laughs> and you said we – now, that's going to be fun having two Chris's on the webinar, so I'll stay in the background, or else we'll be Chris S. and Chris B. How about that, if we need to be? Uh, now, uh, you said we, and that implies expert number two is sitting right next to expert number one, and expert number two is Mark Hembry, the product marketing manager for HC Companies. Welcome to you as well, Mark. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for having us. We're looking forward to the conversation today. It's going to be a good time. And you guys got enough room. You're in a palatial office, so you're not elbowing each other or, uh, or anything like that? It's all good. We have plenty of room. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And me, you know where I broadcast from, you know, the, uh, the 400th floor of the uh, Ball Publishing Broadcast Tower. Uh, but let's let's do a little bit of housekeeping uh, first as before we I let the guys dive in, and that is, uh, you know the drill now. If you've got questions as we go along, they're over, off to the right side of your screen. I believe it's on the right. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but wherever it is, there's a question spot someplace on your screen, and you can type in a question. And uh, and I will be watching them as go, we go along. And if you've got a question that's pertinent to what the guys are talking about at the time, I'll interrupt and I'll I'll pop it in there on your behalf. Uh, and if it's not quite pertinent to what we're talking about, I'll uh, either answer it privately. Sometimes I get a question saying. Uh, why can't I see the pictures? That's why I have to answer a little quick question. Uh, or if it doesn't really pertain to the topic, we'll handle it during the Q&A at the end. Um, if you uh, want to re-watch the webinar, share it with colleagues, or if you have to leave in the middle of it for some reason, uh, you'll be able to go back to the archive at growertalks.com slash webinars, uh, same place you signed up conveniently. And I think that's pretty much it. So uh, I, Mark and Chris, I'm not sure which one of you is going to take it away, but you guys are in control now. Okay. Thank you very much. This is Mark, and uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, so we are here to talk about what makes a growing container automation friendly. So before we get started, we want to just take a minute of your time to tell you a little bit about the HC companies um, and who we are. So we are um, a, a really a, a culmination of, of many really well-respected brands in the container horticultural container industry. Um, I'm sure most, if not all of you, are familiar with Dillon or ITML or Cord or Procal and the like. Um, those brands have all been brought together underneath one banner, which is the HC Company's headquartered here in, in Northeastern Ohio. Um, we have a very strong commitment to excellence for this industry, so we continue to work on innovation um, and bring fresh ideas to, to our industry and promote our industry. Um, we've made significant investments, particularly over the last couple of years, in, in brand new equipment to stay ahead of, of uh of trends and to be able to maintain a production um, to meet everybody's needs. Um, and we also really enjoy and think it's core of our business to listen to our customers, listen to growers, and understand their specific pain points 
so that we can um, develop products and model our business in such a way that it helps you grow. Uh, in terms of the industries that we serve or the, the markets, we serve the greenhouse market, the nursery market, and the consumer market. Um, and, uh, you know, we are, as Chris mentioned at our open, we're, our headquarters, or we're located here in Middlefield, Ohio. That's the, our primary plant. We have secondary manufacturing facilities in Sebring, Florida, Sparks, Nevada, as well as Burlington, Canada, uh, with a distribution center as well in Elyria, Ohio. So we've got um, uh, really nice coverage for the United States. So that's a little bit about us. Um, let's talk about automation in and of itself. So, um, you know, really the question, one of the questions on the table is really why is this push for automation taking place and why is it becoming increasingly important? The reason it's becoming increasingly important, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is the labor market. So in a recent study done by the Department of Agriculture, um, they found that there are almost 60,000 job openings that are going to be available in this industry um, through, uh, through 2020, but there's only going to be about 35,000 graduates who really focus on this industry to fill some of those positions. Um, that becomes somewhat of a challenge for, for the industry in terms of labor. Um, the, the younger generation is really not in, entering the industry at levels that one would hope, uh, and there are multiple reasons for that. One, they just don't understand the, the value of horticulture in our, in our daily lives. Um, they view the industry as, as being very uh, kind of a hands-on, low-paying um, uh, type of, of job, and they don't have a, a real appreciation for um, how this industry really ha ha factors when it comes to things like climate change, social issues, the environment, and the positive impacts that this industry is making. Uh, so one of the uh, takeaways from this, obviously, is, is our, our need to promote the industry as something that should be important to this generation. In terms of new hires, for those that we're able to hire when, when we're able to find talent, quite often we're hiring contract crews um, that fill the void of the labor that's needed. They usually have little or no industry experience or knowledge, so they require a lot of time and, and, uh, and training. Um, which then obviously takes away time from, from the growers and their management team because they, re they require a lot of supervision and, um, and very hands-on type of training. Uh, also, work programs that um, you know, at, at, are, are being reformed, as I'm sure we're all aware. So with things like the immigration reform push that's going on now, H2A, things, things, programs like that are really no longer considered a permanent solution for this industry. It's, it's becoming increasingly challenging to find, um, to find labor. So when we're looking for, automated, um, uh, for automation in, uh, uh, solutions to this, um, Chris is going to take over here at this point and talk about some of the pros and cons in terms of automation. Thanks, Mark. Uh, that's a good recap of you know, really a lot of the challenges that we're seeing in, in this industry as well as other, other industries you know, regarding labor and finding good help. So in, in my 23 years of experience, we've seen automation grow at uh, tremendous rates, uh, no matter what size the grower, uh, 5,000 square feet to a couple million square feet. Uh, every level of any size grower can benefit. And uh, some of the pros that you know, we see uh, it's obviously, first and foremost, it's the labor issue. You're able to do a little bit more uh, with fewer people. It obviously increases efficiencies in planting, uh, transplanting, and filling, and also helps with reducing error. You know, there's a lot more output and less time, thus reducing labor cost. And also, let's, let's face it, it makes a grower more competitive. What are some of the cons? Now, obviously, you know, there's, there can be high upfront expenses depending on what size equipment or automation you're going to buy. I don't really look at it as, as a high expense. You kind of have to look at it as an investment for the future. And then also there's, you know, additional oversight required. You have to have people that are 
maybe somewhat trained. Uh, they know a little bit about the qu equipment. You know, equipment can be a little bit finicky. You got to have people there that know what they're doing. They have to be trained on it. And uh, my experience has been through the greenhouses. There's a number of different people that can figure this equipment out very quick and get it back online. So you need a knowledgeable staff uh, to be able to troubleshoot, you know, the challenges with the equipment. So, you know, some of the popular automated equipment, you know, includes pot and tray fillers. Those are probably uh, the top of the line when you're walking into a greenhouse, the most, most popular. Uh, you have soil and amendment mixing. You have transplanting robots, transporting, and then obviously label and printing uh, for UPC identification, responsibility, and scanning. So automated equipment, you know, it fills the gap. The reality is, is that all greenhouses, like I said before, can benefit from some level of automation, whether you're small, medium, large. Uh, we, we see that smaller operations tend to, see, uh, tend to start and see immediate results from pot and tray filling equipment. So why are fillers a popular choice? Those entering into auto, uh, the automated area. Well, it's inexpensive compared to some of the robotics. It's very reliable. They have very effective designs. And there's, there's a tremendous labor savings. And then you have a uni, uh, uniform fill. You know, with, with soil filling and flat filling, um, you can set those brushes down as high or as low. You can reduce the soil, increase the soil in your fill. Also, you know, with soil filling, you have waste or scrap. You know, that spills off to the sides. A lot of the equipment today actually puts that back into the process so that you have zero waste. So the big thing is, is well, what, what makes a growing container automation friendly? So it's a number. It, it would seem like it would be very simple, but it's anything but simple. Uh, I would say the most important thing is, is if you're buying a round pot, it has to be round. So each pot has to have a consistent round figure. You can't have some that are oval smashed. That's why packaging is such an important part for plastic flower pots. If you have a square pot, you need, the integrity needs to be exactly square from pot to pot. Consistency. If it's a tray that you're using through filling equipment and it's a rectangle, it, each tray has to be a rectangle. You can't have pressure from packaging pushing on one corner to the next and making the tray out of square. That way it will not denest. You need to have very consistent wall thickness. You need to have consistent bottoms. You have to have extremely consistent rims and rim spacing and gauge thickness. Typically, we find that the minimum rim spacing between any type of a pot, round or square, or carry tray needs to have one eighth of an inch gap between each of the either pot or tray. So you need to have that plenty of space for especially automated type fingers and stacking uh, equipment so that those fingers or grippers can get in between the pots or trays and de-nest those one at a time. There's also uh, becoming popular is the suction automated type of, of equipment. So instead of automation fingers coming in and separating each of these pots or trays, there's equipment now available where uh, you may have a stack of pots that could be 4x3, by 5x3, three, by three, and you have uh, little suction cups that go down into each of those in a platform of 15 little suction cups that will go down and grab each pot singly. In the center of each pot is a solid, flat surface. And then you have air, which is sucking, which pulls up, let's say, 15 pots at one time out of the machine, and then it will put it into, uh, into the trays. So the key, the key aspect of these containers is a flat, suctionable center. You can't have a, you know, a large drain hole in the center if you're using suction cup design. Another thing that's important is you need to have sturdy sidewall construction. Uh, again, sidewall, your rim dimensions, the stacking ledges, and then also, you know, the bottoms of the pot so that they're very sturdy and strong to be able to withstand 
some of the pressures just in freight riding down the road. Um, you know, in, in a lot of part of the country with the hard winters we have, especially in the spring with the, the frost heaving and thawing, you get a lot of bumpy roads. Well, it doesn't seem like much, but when it's driving down the road with, you know, a truckload of flower pots and everything is banging and compacting, you got to have some good engineering in your pots, in, in the rims and the stacking ledges to keep those from uh, sticking together. Okay, what makes a container automation uh, not friendly would be having too thin of a sidewall and or in this example, we have a blow molded container that we're showing which has, uh, you can maybe see in the picture some uh, like a rib design. Well, that's to increase the strength of the sidewall for a different purpose, but as far as for automation equipment for blow mold is a little more difficult because of the way uh, the pots are stacked together so tightly to get more uh, more density on a skid, which obviously helps you know in the long term for most growers is to help reduce their cost and also space savings. As we know, there's a lot of our customers that are limited on space of where they can store things. Another example is not enough space in between flower pots, uh, and in the, this example. We have a square pot that essentially doesn't have any kind of an area to grab. There looks like there's a gap in between each of those pots. Uh, there actually isn't, and there's not enough of a lip for the fingers to get in there and drop each one of those pots one at a time. So you need to have more of a gap when you're using automated finger style equipment. So another question is, is, is there a manual automated solution with similar efficiency and benefits? There is. We have a number of them, but the first one we wanted to kind of talk about here today is, uh, is our quick lock design. So you would have a, a, a box of flower pots, and this is a particular four and a half inch square that we have. Uh, there's 660 in a case, and it's a three by five configuration. So three rows of five, and there's 660 pots. You would dump this box out uh, with the bottoms facing up, and then you have no box on it, and they're all sitting there, all in nice little stacks, just like they were in a box, but no box. And then you're going to grab your appropriate quick lock tray, uh, which is a 15 count tray that we make, and it has little grippers in the bottom of the uh, bottom of the pocket, which will, are are uh, they're lined up exactly with the four different drain holes, two in specific, that will grab and lock your pots into the trays. And then as you push these down, it's going to grab each one of those rows or stacks um, by going across with your hands and pushing down from top to bottom, bottom to top, side to side. It doesn't matter which way you do it as long as you're as long as you're pushing enough where the tray is coming into contact with each one of those bottoms of those pots. And then you're going to lift that up, and you're going to have a complete 15-count you know, carry tray fully filled instead of maybe one by one filling those pockets by hand, which is, again, more time. We also have a number of different growers that will use this process, and they'll lay their benches out uh, with each of the pots. So with a square pot design, you have all these trays and pots put together, lined up on a bench. They'll actually break the bags open of soil on top. And they may take like um, actually a piece of a pallet, like a nice square, um, or like a scraper. And you push that stuff around on top of the pots. It's all one continuous uh, planting area or filling surface and they're grading off that soil and moving it to different parts of the benches as it's in these pots and it's filling that area up in a very quick matter of time. We have a video here we wanted to show to you know, give you kind of a, an example of exactly how it's done. And um, you'll see, as I described before, the stack of the pots. He's going through from the top to the middle and he's lifting them up, and those little quick grippers in the bottoms of each of those pockets are grabbing every single one of those like pots, like and he's filling them very efficiently. You know what I like about this video, guys? He's having a good time doing it. Look at it. <laughs>
<laughs> it's a happy customer. <laughs> there you go. And, 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 and with that particular, that's a, a, you know, a new state of the art pot. It's a, uh, it, it was an older version, and we made a lot of improvements to it. We added tag slot to it and, and, a, uh, and an enormous amount of additional drainage as there's not many growers out there that I've ever met with or talked with that's not open to more drainage. And um, that's just taking something from the past that's always been a very popular item and rebuilding it and making a lot of nice little improvements to it to be able to help our growers you know, grow a better crop and be you know, a lot more profitable. So, you know, to kind of, you know, wrap up a little bit of the, you know, the, the summary is you need to have plenty of space defined in the rim, you know, for those automation fingers to grab for each of the denesting, like I said, it, whether it's a square pot, a round pot, a tray, whatever you're using, you have to have space in between. They can't be smashed together to where there's no room for those fingers to get in. You know, the sidewall, sturdy sidewall construction, your design of your rim, what is your stacking? How thick is it? How, what is the consistency of your manufacturer that's producing the sheet? Uh, is it thick on one side of the pot and thin on the other? That's where it's incumbent upon the manufacturer that it has strict quality control so that we're producing the, most, the best possible pot for you that is consistent from pot to pot, that every pot is round, that there's not friction in the sidewall as these things are, are uh, denesting. And then for suction cup automation, as I said earlier, you know, it's becoming more and more popular. You need to have a flat, center, solid surface. Can't have a drain hole in the center of that pot. So that pot can go up and grab that, or the sucker can go down and grab that pot. It has to have that solid area so it's, 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 it's sucking the bottom and pulling each one of them up. Okay, so... Um the HC Companies is offering for everybody on this webinar um, a, a kit, if you will, an assortment of, of automation-friendly pots in a, in a tray um, to be able to see some examples for yourself. So all you would need to do is send an email to our customer ser uh, service team at customer support at h-hc-companies.com with the subject line Grower Talks Webinar Samples. Uh, Please include your name, your company's name, address, and phone number in the body of the email, and we will be pa uh, happy to, to pick, pack, and ship you an assortment of some automation-friendly containers for you to take a look at. Of course, our team is always available to answer any questions that you may have as well, so feel free to include any questions you may have in, in the email if you've got them uh, at the time that you're asking for samples. Um, and... With that, we'll open it up to any questions that anyone may have. All right, thanks, Mark and Chris. And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna switch it back one slide just to leave that address up, so folks can actually. I want to jot this down myself. You know, spring gardening season's coming up, but uh, shh. Uh, <laughs> but let's do uh, tackle a few questions. Uh, what I, one of the things I like about this particular topic is it's it's simple. Oftentimes we get involved and you, you have more questions than you got answers. And this seems like it's a, like getting a good container uh, to assist your, your mechanization or automa auto automation is, is actually pretty simple. But what I want to know is, is it a mistake then when growers uh, look only at the price of the container when they're shopping for containers? Because it seems like one of those places where if you're going to save a penny or two, hey, let's do it on the pot. How do you, how do you address that, guys? You know, if you're going to look at moving to something that's a little bit less, you know, it's more cost effective, you certainly, before jumping right into it, you, you, you have to do a trial. And, and that's been my experience when we've either converted somebody or somebody else has converted to something, uh, a different type of a product is knowing exactly what you're getting into, especially if you're using automation type equipment. So we will tend to send a case uh, for a trial prior to if somebody's, you know, buying a sizable order to make sure that that is a uh, product that will work through their automation equipment. The last thing you'd ever want to have happen is to convert over something like that and then it turn out it doesn't work in your system. Not, not good. 
but it's automatically going to cost more if I've got those nice straight solid sides and the good lip and all that kind of stuff, right? Oh, no, that's all free, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got to stay competitive, right? Especially for those the bigger growers who are automated and need a lot of pots, you've obviously got to stay competitive. So we'll, we'll yeah, that's that you know it, it, as it, it is. It, yeah. it, it, it sure does, and, and, it, and that's to be expected. That's what our customers and our, our growers are expecting. It has to work within their system. So, you know, it, it's on us to make sure that we're delivering to them exactly what they need, and there's a 100% uh, uh, workable solution. All right. I, I, right. I would agree. I would, also add, I would also add, I think that there's, you know, we have to be careful that certainly looking to save money everywhere that we can in this industry is very, very important. But you also have to be careful that we're not being penny wise and pound foolish. So when you're looking, to Chris's point, when you're looking at an automation system or you're utilizing automation, making sure that you've got a pot that works in it, it's the overall efficiency that you gain from that automation that is the cost savings. And so while it's possible that the pot may cost a little bit more because the, the wall construction has to be a little thicker or, or something of that, of that nature, um, it's looking at the overall picture and understanding that everything working through that automation in the end is going to save a lot more money, be much more cost effective than does a, you know, filling these by hand. Yeah, Victor has a question along those lines. Actually, it's a it's a pretty complicated question. I called it the sixty four dollar question here. Um, he uh, wants to know about using containers to meet the, the flexibility that his big box customers demand. If you're selling to several big boxes, they all want something different, a different form factor, different sizes. Um, how can a container manufacturer help a big grower meet those needs and still be efficient through automation and, and distribution and things like that? Pretty big question. Man, if I could... If I, I could make a million dollars if I could answer that one with the most more, most amount of accuracy. Uh, that's a huge challenge because as as we know the 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 box like if you want to say the big big box does try to differentiate product lines even colors sizes styles everybody wants to have that different look and with that comes from the manufacturer a plethora of molds that we have to build. And the challenge for us is it's a, you know, some of those tools are three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars a pop. It would behoove us if if all three box, let's say three big box stores would go with one hanging basket or one round four inch or you know one particular size. And it's difficult, it's very difficult. Um, you, you, because they're, they're, the box is driving the volume, and they're also driving the spec of what a grower has to, to, to grow in. We don't really, we're not able to really make that call. It's, it's up to the box store as far as what they're growing in. So that's a fantastic question, and I just don't know if I can give a good enough of an answer as I wish we could control that more, and we don't. Right. I, 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 would, I would add on to that by saying that particularly when it comes to the big boxes and the growers. Um, the container, container manufacturers are, are typically looped into that conversation as well at some point after, after, the, fact. after the fact. And so uh, from our position, you know, we, do, we strive to meet as many needs as, as, as possible on the part of the growers because at the end of the day, we want the growers to be successful. And so you know, we, well, we work with, with many growers dealing with many big boxes um, but you know, to the point, they all want to be differentiated in some way, shape, or form, and um, you know, it's just kind of like working together, I guess, with the growers to really kind of stay uh, stay aware of where the where the big boxes are in terms of their thought process for the coming year or two years down the road, and starting to work early enough to figure out how we can accommodate that. Yeah, and, and Chris, I'd certainly say, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say that certainly in my travels, I've never, uh, you know, I've visited many of the biggest growers across uh, uh, the U.S. and Canada, and uh, all of them, especially the big ones selling to the big boxes, are highly automated, and they have become more flexible, more diverse because of that. Uh, you walk in and you see hundreds of shapes, sizes, 
colors for all of their customers. And I believe they tell me that they can only do that because of automation and certainly making sure that each of those containers is able to run through their automation without jamming up or whatever. So I think that's it's uh, it's more critical, but the automation allows that level of flexibility. 10 years ago, you went into, or maybe 20 years ago, you went into a place and you saw you know, three containers. Now I'm not surprised to see, you know, 30 or, you know, maybe 300. Yeah. It's it's the different differentiation in the market. Everybody wants to have something uh, you know a little bit different. And another thing that we're seeing too, when it comes to uh, maybe hanging baskets and planters, uh, more of the larger size items, you'll see a spec come down from uh, the big box saying you're growing in this, this, and this. And then when it comes to the smaller, let's say pints and quarts, four inch, uh, maybe six inch. That's kind of opened up to the grower to be able to kind of just go by whoever they want to. It's not really spec. Mm -hmm. Now, I knew we would get this topic. In fact, I warned you a little bit and prepared you for it, and that is uh, sustainability. Uh, Elizabeth wants to know, are there any materials more sustainable than plastic that are being developed with automation in mind? Um, so that's been one of the challenges of the industry. So if for those of you that are familiar with, with our product portfolio, we do manufacture an entire line of, um, of uh, biodegradable pots and, and trays and the like in our EcoGrow um, line. And that's, those are made in a closed loop um, facility, our closed loop facility in, in Canada, meaning that there's no wastewater generated. Um, we generate zero waste in the production of those. Um, the challenge with those, quite frankly, is that while they are significantly more environmentally friendly, they, it, it, the development continues in terms of making them consistent in terms of things like wall thickness. Um, and the, you know, Chris talked early on in this presentation about the, how important the roundness of the pot is, if it's a round pot, or the squareness of the pot, if it's a square one. When we're working with materials that make biodegradable pots, it's very, very challenging to make those uh, in very tight tolerances so that they are absolutely consistent for automation. So the, the short answer, I think, to the, to the question, Chris, is that um, you know, automation when it comes to the biodegradable types of pots um, is very limited, so certainly not to the level that they are right now with, with plastic pots. Um, it's it's just it's kind of the nature of the beast and how these things are produced and the materials themselves when you're talking about recyclable um, materials biodegradable materials don't react the same way in in a production process as do plastics so you don't get a nice smooth surface um, so there's there's you know it's it's its own unique challenge I, I right and you know, I, and just in general, uh, tell us what your brands are doing in the way of um, degradable or biodegradable containers. Yeah, so Kenneth we have, so as question. I mentioned, sure, we, we have a full line of, of, uh, of fiber containers that we manufacture. Um, and we have them, uh, they're called, uh, we have our fiber grow line. Some of those products, for example, some hanging baskets and the like are reinforced with wax. Um, to make to give them some additional strength, others are in our what we call an eco grow line, and those are completely biodegradable. Um, and then we have we actually have that same eco grow line um, uh, repurposed or reconditioned, I should say, as an organic line. So they're certified as being suitable for organic farming, um, and those again are all um, completely biodegradable. Um, they typically have a life of, of a you know of a season in those for those particular ones the eco grow type line um, long enough to get you know the plant started and sold through and for you know the consumer of the greenhouse to sell it. All right, and um, so what are what are growers what are your customers asking you today? What's their biggest challenge with containers, or what would they love to see you working on? Can you give us any any sneak? peek into the future? Well, I, so from some, from a marketing perspective uh, and kind of the, the feedback I get from the industry um, as well as our own team that's meeting with our customers all the time, automation is a challenge. 
for a lot of folks. Actually, the bigger challenge, as we talked about at first, is labor. And so looking for opportunities, what can we as a as a container, horticultural container manufacturer, what can we do to improve the efficiency of the grower when labor is is such a difficult thing to come by? Um, and so, for example, this this whole um, webinar around you know automation and, and and automation friendly containers. As automation develops, we try to stay ahead of what's going on in that in the automation portion of the industry, so that we're producing containers that will work with that automation. Um, so that the um, so that when that automation comes out, there's there's a container that works for it. Um, so we find that to be very very important. Um, you know, being finding ways to be flexible with our customers is also very important. As Chris mentioned earlier, right? How what can we do to to improve in terms of their space efficiencies, uh, where they don't may not have room to to store an entire season's worth of pots? So what can we as a manufacturer do to help out in in, in that arena. Um, you know, being cost effective is always at the top of everybody's list. Um, and we certainly, uh, when we're developing products and looking at, at uh, you know, at new products, we're also looking at what their position would be in the marketplace. What's what's a good cost effective solution for, for many of the issues that growers face because every penny counts in this industry. Um, and so I think it's a, a you know a recognition that that's the case, and making sure that we're bringing the right balance of of uh, of good product, high quality product, and uh, and good pricing to the marketplace is important. So I don't know. If Jack you sounds good. There, Chris. No, it's a lot of it is is how do we push the limits and still produce the the a superior product. Uh, where can we take a little bit of weight out here? Where can we take a little bit of weight out there and not impact the grower through his automation equipment or denesting? Right. All right, last question uh, before we wrap up. Um, and you kind of hinted at this, guys, but, uh, but should growers or can growers be asking more from their container suppliers? Are there, uh, you know, services, advice, um, you, you know, Tech, technology, other things that growers could be uh, getting more of from you guys, and they're just not tapping into that. Well, we we do a number of, you know, we have a, a full-time sales staff from coast to coast, north to south, that are in different territories that are making calls on on growers every day. And um, we're, we're hands-on, we're face-to-face, we're available by phone. And you know what? What we typically share is because we're spread across the country. Um, you know, we have a lot of our guys that communicate from either the West Coast to the East Coast, the North and the South, and we're seeing what people are doing. Uh, for example, the video we showed, um, you know, earlier, you know, as an example of one of our customers that was kind enough to give us that to show how they do it, so that we could share with maybe a, a grower who's using uh, a pot that's similar to that in a tray, but they're putting them in by hand. So we, we talk a lot here amongst ourselves at HC and what people are doing in the field, and we try to share that knowledge across the whole entire database from east to west uh, to those customers. Hey, I was at so-and-so's greenhouse. I saw them doing these trays this way. Have you ever considered that? Uh, a call that I made last week was this actual video to a grower uh, that had never seen anything like this before, although we've been <laughs> we've been selling this product for quite some time. And as he as the in the video, the guy put the first tray down, and he picked up all fifteen pots. The guy grabbed the phone out of my hands and said, "Let me see that." And he was like immediately sold. He watched it and said, "I definitely want to trial that." So we just like to share information what what people are doing across the country. Uh, to help all of our growers, right? And I think it's and I think it's important too. I, for if you're, it doesn't make any difference whether you're a small smaller grower, right, with with less acreage or a great big grower. To us, you're important, um, and to any of your vendors, you should be important. And so I think probably what I would say that uh, it's really take advantage of the knowledge base um, that your suppliers have. Um, and their willingness to work with you and share knowledge, as Chris mentioned, um, whether you're, you know, considered to be a a, a you know, national grower or a or a smaller little regional grower, um, we're here to serve 
you, as are all of your vendors. All right. Well, to that end, how about I share both your email addresses uh, with all of your new friends who've been tuned into the webinar so they can contact you anytime, 24-7, 365, with their questions about containers. Now, you've got, you've got two experts, everybody, uh, at your disposal. Uh, so all that said, um, that's how you ask uh, additional questions if we didn't get to them in this webinar. If you want to uh, listen again or share it with your colleagues, like I said, it will be archived as soon as I can manage it at uh, growertalks.com slash webinars. Uh, and here's where I get to uh, put in a little bit of a commercial. I've got two more webinars coming up. One uh, next Wednesday. I love the title of this. These guys suck. Uh, and that's actually going to be with my uh, my friend and and editor J C Chong, uh, who's going to be talking about current management tools uh, uh, and approaches for aphid and white fly control. And another uh, similar but different one with a politer title: Overcoming Piercing and Sucking Insects. That's going to be Thursday, May sixteenth. So you can sign up for those, or at least get more details at the same place where you check the archive: www.grotox.com slash webinars. Uh, and I think that's it. Well, uh, Chris and Mark, I want to thank you for the great information and um, hope you enjoyed yourself uh, once we got everything rolling. We did. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, yeah. thank you. for those guys uh, and all the other fine folks at the HC companies and for my stellar ball publishing staff who, uh, as you well know, work hard so I don't have to, this is Chris Beatty saying so long, everybody. 